Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cision webinar, Practicing, Practice Listening from Competitors to Customers. I'm Michelle Tisdell, Director of Product Marketing, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Today's amazing speakers will show you how to spark ideas for your business with competitive analysis, boost your brand reputation by aligning with influencers, generate leads with data from social conversations, improve your organization's operations using customer feedback, and humanize your brand by empowering employees on social. And before we get started, we have a few quick housekeeping uh, points to make. There will be a moderated Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to use the chat box on um, the screen that you have in front of you and submit those throughout the, the conversation today. If you want a copy of the slides, they will be posted to Cision.com, as well as SlideShare after today's webinar. And if you're on Twitter and you want to tweet about the webinar, please use the following hashtag Cision Webinar, one word, and uh, we'll be moderating those as well. And of course, the person that has the best tweets will get a prize, so definitely tweet away. Uh, lastly, in your application, you may notice that it is customizable. Feel free to drag and drop the screens as appropriate for your needs. We have several speakers today. I'll kick us off and I'll introduce our first speaker, Jay Baer. Jay Baer is the founder of strategy consulting firm called Convince and Convert, which provides social media and content marketing advice to leading companies. His new book, Hug Your Haters, will be out in early 2016. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Jay, and welcome. Michelle, thanks so much. I am delighted to be here uh, and joining all of you for this fantastic webinar. So, so why, are we, why are we doing this webinar? Because everybody out there who's in the social media world will tell you that what you really need to do is listen. you got to do some of that listening. Uh, but what does that really mean? Everybody accepts that to be true, but what does it really mean? To whom should you be listening? Where should you listen? How should you listen? Why should you be listening? And with what should you listen? We wanted to cover those important issues here today, and I am unable to make that happen myself, so I recruited an all-star cast of webinar participants to join me today. Uh, we have Mark, we have Scott, we have Neil, we have Jeff, we have me. The five of us are coming together super friends style to bring you today's webinar. A couple of housekeeping notes, uh, most of which we touched on uh, previously, but, but just to, to recap, we're going to record it. You can ask questions. Cision webinar is the hashtag Yes, the elusive Scott Stratton, uh, who is very rarely seen on webinars, is actually here and will be, will be presenting part of today's session. And in fact, Scott is taking a way back trip, a, a, a trip into his past when he used to be an HR professional. And he's going to talk to you about how to listen to employees, which is exciting. And the elusive Jeff Bullis is actually joining us from Australia uh, he's part of the webinar as well. He'll be speaking uh, soon, and you'll know it's him because he sounds like he is from Australia. Without further ado, let's get into the first of five pieces of today's Bang Up webinar. Please bring your hands together for my friend, Jeff Bullis. Thanks, Jay, for that great introduction. And we're actually in New York, not from Australia at the moment, so I'm actually in town. So. What I'm going to touch on today is how to listen to your competitors, and a little bit more than that. We're actually going to teach you how to spy on your competition and steal some of their secrets. And when I started my blog, I decided that I needed to look at some of the best in my industry and learn from them. So we're going to touch on some of the tips that I've learned over the last six years as I've grown my blog. A little bit about me. Um, I am a blogger. I started six years ago in March 2009. Uh, today, we have about 5 million visitors a year to blog, uh, one of the top 10 full social media influencers, uh, international speaker and uh, best-selling author, and I'm number one in content marketing as an influencer. Enough about me. It was a couple of years ago, I was working early from the office one morning, and there was a knock on the door, and a courier was there with a very large package. And I looked at the package struggled at my desk, put it down, and looked at where it was from. It was from London. And it was for my colleague, Patrick. And when Patrick came in later that morning, I said to him, Patrick, what's this 25-kilogram box? And he said, it's a car suspension part. And I said, why did you get it from London? 
it was delivered to Sydney, you know, halfway around the world. And he said, Jeff, it was 40% cheaper. That's why I bought it. And this highlights the point with this new social web and digital world. Your competitor is no longer just your corner store or someone in your same city or even in the same country. You're actually competing against the rest of the world. So your competition is global. And we've got to keep this in mind. I quite often hear people saying, when's the best time to tweet? Well, all the time, because competition is 24-7. Not only is competition global, it is digital. And we've really got to, with this digital revolution, and I say that against digital evolution, because it's changing so quickly, that competition is now digital. We've got to really think digital in everything we do, whether it's marketing, whether it's you know, building technology for your business, whether it's publishing, you've got to think digital. And that is something you've really got your head around because a lot of us are brought up in this very analog world where everything was in print. There was faxes, those strange machines that are now collecting dust in the corner of offices and, and on dump sites. Competition is also huge. We have over 1 billion websites. That is a lot of competition. There are over 2 billion smartphones. And that's something to really keep in mind because the reality is that Six years ago when I started the blog, it was actually almost no smartphones apart from the Crackberries, as we used to call them. And there's three billion more internet users appearing over the next five years. So your competition is not only huge now, it's just going to get bigger. So the earlier you start, the better your advantage. But how do you innovate in this digital world and how do you spy on your competitors? Well. Because this social web has happened in the last few years, you can now go and check them out. You can go in and Google your competitors. One of the best ways I've found is actually put in top 10 social media influencers or something like that and have a look at what they're doing. So Google is a great way to start. You don't need to overcomplicate this when you actually want to start checking out your competitors. Number two, you need to go and check out their social networks. Because what your competitors are doing on the social media sites is going to be very transparent. And that's a great way to get some insights into what they're doing. The third thing is, if you're going to check out your competition, that's great. But the problem is if you just do that, we're all going to become just bland brands, all doing the same stuff. So we really need to check out the innovators in the different parts of uh, the industry in which we're working in. So if you're doing some publishing as part of what you do, go and check out some of the top publishers in the world. So there are the three important steps that we really need to do when you listen to competitors. You need to actually go beyond listening to competitors. So how do you innovate? This is a image of a company blog called Mavoto. And what they did was they actually copied other people's ideas. I love this quote by Steve Jobs. We have always been shameless about stealing great ideas. So quite often when you start, you need to be copying and then providing your own voice to it. After that then, it comes down to innovation. So Mavoto was just a little real estate blog just two and a half years ago. All it had was 2,000 visitors a month. And they decided to model their site, their blog, on some of the best viral content sites in the world. And they were sites like Viral Nova, Upworthy, and I'm sure you've heard of BuzzFeed. They did this so well, this modeling, that what happened was within two years, they were receiving 18 million visitors to their site. So what did they do? They got clarity on their goals. What they wanted to do was they wanted to build traffic. That's what they're after, traffic. They got very clear, very succinct. They kept the end game in mind. They wanted to build inbound links. They hustled and pitched their content. Not only did they create content, they actually hustled it out there. And content marketing is two words, content and marketing. It's not build it and they will come. 
They also modeled the innovators. They just didn't go and check out other real estate companies. They actually modeled some of the innovators in different digital platforms around the world. The last two points in terms of the keys to innovative success is they implemented viral marketing tactics. They worked out how to create viral. Now, BuzzFeed actually started as a viral marketing company. They, wanted, they were a data company, and that's what viral marketing is about these days. It's about big data. Not only did they do that, they actually optimized their website. And these are the key things they did for, for click-through rates, for sharing, and for search. So it's not just doing one thing, it's actually the synergy of multiple efforts. So wrapping this up, you've got to go beyond thinking local. Most of us work in the knowledge industry, and this is easy to sell around the world. So we've got to think global. Model the best in your industry, and don't just stop there. You need to innovate from the outside. Go and look at some of the different niches, such as some of the greatest publishers that are creating tens of millions of views, and look at what they're doing. That's all from me for the moment. I hand it over to my next speaker. Hello, everyone. This is Mark Schaefer. I'm so delighted to be here with uh, all of my friends and quite honored to be invited uh, by Jay and, and Sijin to be with you. Uh, I have taught at uh, Rutgers University for the last six years. I'm a consultant, primarily with big brands and companies around the world. My blog is Grow. I have a podcast that I love to do with my friend Tom Webster called The Marketing Companion, and I've written five uh, books. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about one of those uh, today. This is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, the idea of influence and, and, and using influencers on the web. So in 2012, they wrote this book called Return on Influence. It was the first book of its type about influence marketing. And at the end of that book, I predicted that in the next two years, influence marketing would become a mainstream marketing activity. And who could have ever expected uh, how it has just uh, blown up on the web? And I'm going to tell you today why it's more important than ever and why connecting to influencers and understanding influences, influences in our market is more important than ever. So this little chart kind of represents the conversation that's in marketing today. We talk about content and creating more content and better content, optimized content. How do we grow our audience? How do we get more likes, more followers? But what we're missing is this idea of ignition. The economic value of content that isn't seen, that isn't shared, is absolutely zero. So we have to think about creating a new competency now on ignition. And this is really hard to do. How do we get people to move our content? How do we get them to share our content? This is one of my favorite charts that I use in a lot of my marketing classes. And it's so simple, but to me, this represents what marketing is all about. Over time, we want to create opportunities to interact with our, our company and our brand, these provocations that will lead to higher and higher forms of engagement over time. This is really what marketing is all about in one chart. And it's not easy. It takes time. It takes a lot of effort. Now, generally on the web today, these provocations come in the form of content. We create content to try to create these opportunities, these interactions that will lead to some kind of engagement. Now at the very bottom, we start with awareness. Sometimes when we put this content out there, it might feel like we're throwing a message in a bottle out into the ocean. We don't really know if people are seeing it or not. But eventually, if we do a good job creating useful content on a consistent basis, something magical happens. And this is a, a term that I've adopted from my friend Jay Bear. He coined this term, reliable reach. It's a term I like very much because in a virtual way, people are opting in. They're saying, I believe in you whenever they subscribe to your blog, subscribe to your video or your newsletter. So the reach becomes more reliable. And then finally, 
who knows how long this might take, maybe several years. You have to be able to show some sort of a financial measure or a measure that indicates a financial return. So this takes a tremendous amount of effort. It takes a tremendous amount of time, perhaps years. Now here's the problem. Not everybody has that amount of time. Not everybody has that amount of resources to be able to connect, to build audiences, to build trust in a large way in a short period of time. And that's where influence marketing comes in because in the absence of a large audience and this trust, we can borrow that by connecting with influencers. This is a really big topic. The one thing I chose to talk about today is the three different kinds of influencers because this kind of gets messed up in people's minds when we talk about uh, influence. Now, the first kind of influence is the celebrity influencer. This is the oldest kind of influence. The first celebrity influencers were Charlie Chaplin and Babe Ruth. They were the first ones to be product sponsors uh, back in the 1920s. Today, someone like Kim Kardashian, uh, she's not building her influence by um, making creating content. She's famous. And she's, she's a celebrity because she is known. She has an enormous pipeline. And no matter what you might think of some of these celebrity actors or, or athletes or performers, they have a tremendous amount of, of pull on their audiences. People follow them. People look at what they're wearing. Now, they're probably not going to have a lot of active engagement with your brand. So you're going to have to buy your way in. That's pretty much the way this works. But this really works well if your goal is image. So there's a celebrity out there and you want to align your image with their image. That is why you would use a celebrity endorser. The second kind of influencer, well, these niche influencers are typically what we think about when we talk about influence on the web today. These are self-made heroes. Uh, an example is Bethany Moda. Bethany is 19 years old. She's got more than 9 million followers on YouTube. And she's already a millionaire by creating these amazing videos uh, on the web. Her influence is definitely based on content. And her, her advocacy, it might be authentic or it might be sponsored. It could go either way. But they have a very large, engaged, uh, really passionate audience. They've got a great pipeline and probably limited brand engagement. Not because they don't love you and they don't and they want to work with you. It's because their time is really limited. And I got to meet Bethany down at South by Southwest last year. And one of the very wise things she said, she said, you know, I'm, I sponsor this uh, retail clothing brand. I don't wear their clothes all the time. Why would I? And I'm thinking in my mind, well, because they're paying you. She said, no. If I wore their clothes all the time, people would know something is wrong. That's just not the way I would, I would be in the world. And so these, these influencers have, are so busy and in such demand, they have very, very limited uh, bandwidth, really, to promote your product. But if your goal is awareness, there's nothing more powerful because these people have a vast audience and they can help you get the word out very, very quickly. The last kind of influencer is really my favorite. These are the advocates. These are the people who are just passionate about whatever you do. They can't get enough of your company, your brand, and your product. Now, their pipeline may not be as big as Kim Kardashian or Bethany Moda, but in their niche, they have a very passionate audience. Uh, and they're, they're, you don't have to beg these people for help. You don't have to cajole them or even pay them. They just love you. They want to support you. So it's very, very important to connect with these people. Now, of all the different influencers, this is the one that's most important to really connect to uh, on a very, very intimate basis. 
You, you really need to learn these people and, and know who they are, see what they're talking about, because this is what can drive sales. This is a great source of ideas when you see what they're doing, what, how they're using your product. It's a great opportunity for social proof on the web. It's, a, it, it's an incredible opportunity also for awareness and for cost-effective reach. So to wrap things up, it's so important, it's more important than ever really, to connect with uh, uh, influencers on the web today, especially advocates, because uh, we're living in this world of information density. And a lot of people don't have the time and resources to be able to cut through. Business goes very fast. We need to move ahead quickly. And then there's this idea, the rise of the citizen influencers, people like Bethany, people like Robert Scoble. They weren't born famous. Uh, they, they grew their audience through content. And this idea of standing out in this information-dense world through ignition, again, points to the importance of aligning with influencers to help you accomplish that. And that is my uh, conversation today. And uh, we'll hand it over to the next uh, presenter. Well, thank you, Mark. From one Schaefer to another, uh, this is Neil Schaefer speaking. I'm going to be talking about how to generate leads from social conversations. I also wanted to thank uh, Jay Bear and Sijian, you know, one of the true leaders in the space, for the invitation to present. And it really is an honor to be presenting with so many uh, wonderful, what I would like to call social media celebrities, but uh, brilliant minds of their own. So let's look at now, we've, we're analyzing the different ways in which we can utilize social conversations. I really want to focus on the lead generation aspect. And uh, before I do that, though, I'll just briefly introduce myself. One slide for those of you that don't know me. I am a social media speaker, consultant, author. I've been blogging since 2008. The name of that blog now is called Maximize Social Business. I wrote my first of three books in 2009, my most recent being Maximize Your Social, which is off my personal website. And I do a lot of consulting. I do a lot of speaking. I just came back from uh, speaking in South Africa last week where I thought I saw Scott Stratton at a watering hole during my safari trip. Not sure, though. Um, I also teach as part of the Rutgers uh, Mini Social Media MBA program, which uh, Mark Schaefer uh, is a veteran teaching there. And in December, I'll start teaching at the Irish Management Institute for those of you in Europe, co-founder of the Social Tool Summit, social media conference focused around social media tools, and founder of the new Community for Social Media Professionals, Social Media Center of Excellence. I am a fast speaker, so let's move on to the content. So how does listening translate to actual dollars? And hopefully as I read through this, some of you will be nodding your head because this is something that happens all the time for those that know who to listen to, what to listen to, and can act upon the data that they find. And I use this example. This is not a new example by any means, but I find in, in educating companies and professionals, uh, there are some things that are evergreen. And this is just an evergreen case study of something that happened several years ago, but it illustrates a few important points about listening and how to generate leads from that listening. So some of you may already know the story, and if you do, my apologies. Uh, but, you know, 9 a.m., a random tweet, seemingly random tweet, right? Shortel or Avaya, time for a new phone system very soon. Well, Avaya was listening, right? Uh, this, we're talking about, you know, telecommunications equipment here, uh, phones for, for business use, what have you. So 15 minutes later, Avaya's listening, and they know Shortel's their competitor. I don't know if they were listening for the keyword Avaya or the keyword Shortel or the keyword phone system uh, or all three, right? Uh, but 15 minutes later, they tweeted back. So they were quick at listening. It was targeted, and they responded. And they responded in a very professional way. Hey, our highly trained techs can help you make an objective decision. Give me a call. They're not trying to sell someone. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but, you know, social media gives us the ability to eavesdrop, for lack of a better word, on a lot of conversations. But those old rules of, of business etiquette are more important than ever. So it's not just the listening, but the actual responding. And then 13 days later, they were able to close the deal. This thing goes into their pipeline. Uh, it just happened to be a, a lead generated from social listening, and they generated a quarter million dollars from this. So as a disclaimer, everybody listening, I'm not guaranteeing that you're going to close a quarter million dollar deal from social listening, but it really illustrates how this happens. Uh, one of the uh, clients that I work with here locally in Orange County, California, owns a few different hotels near Disneyland. They tweet sometimes, but they really use Twitter more as a way to listen to people that are saying, planning a trip to Disneyland. Where should I stay near Disneyland? 
Anyone have any hotel recommendations for Disneyland? And you start to see a pattern of keywords that they can search for. And every day, whether it's 10 tweets or 20 tweets, they can reach out to these people because Twitter allows them to do that. I'll go into the differences in, in different social networks, but they can reach out to them and say, hey, we have a Twitter discount, 10% off, use this code. And you begin to see how these social conversations really can lead to business. But the problem is what, what is illustrated here, the short tour of Vaya, when people are tweeting, right, they're not necessarily using at meant at handles with your company name. So a lot of companies might, you know, in their Hootsuite or in their Spout Social, they're just listening to app mentions and responding to them. You need to be a lot more proactive in, you know, having columns of company names and product names and brand names, what have you. Because a lot of the conversations just are not as clear to us as we'd like them to be. And sometimes people misspell things as well, right? So if we were to look at all the different things that we can do here, in terms of searching for keywords that could be unique triggers for lead generation. Obviously, it begins with your company name, knowing that uh, a lot of conversations happen without that official mention of the, of the at username. Your product, service, brand name. Obviously, your competitor's company name, your competitor's product or service brand name. What about keywords that describe your product or service? And then, as I mentioned, that common misspellings of any of the above, which could happen. So there's a lot of different things that you can obviously search for. Not all of them are going to give you the same number of leads, but try to find a few that seem to give you, you know, at least a few things a day that you can work on and try to actually create a business case around your social listening program. So I talked about the different ways of eavesdropping in different social networks. And uh, Twitter is obviously the easiest one to eavesdrop in. And I, I just want to explain, and a lot of you probably already know this, but I think when you see it like this, you begin to see the differences here. So if we're on Facebook, even though they have graph search, it's very, very difficult to listen to conversations because of all the privacy filters that exist, right? So Facebook is an example. You have personal profiles. If you're a company, you must have a company page, and then there are communities or groups, and some are open and some are closed. LinkedIn is similar, and in fact, Google Plus is similar as well. Personal profiles, groups, and then business pages. And the problem is it's hard to listen across the platform. Google Plus, I, I suppose, is one that allows us to do that. LinkedIn used to have a great tool called Signal, for those of you that, that remember, that allowed us to listen into everything now. The only thing we can listen into really is some of the group conversations, which will probably change in the near future, as LinkedIn has announced, as well as only if someone has published a post on Pulse and, and not everyone is a content creator. But if we go to the other side, you know, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, any business, whether you're a person or a business, you have the concept of a profile, right? So you could create 10 different profiles on Twitter, which a lot of big brands do, um, and you can engage with others and search for others the same way you do as a person. So we talk about companies starting to humanize their brand. Uh, on these networks, you, you are the human. Uh, you are the same as a human. You have the same sort of functionality and the same way of searching that people do. And this gives us the ability not only to be able to search freely because these networks like Instagram was clearly built to search through, in, through hashtag, but it gives us also the ability to engage freely. If you want to ga engage with other Facebook users from your lonely Facebook page, you really only have paid options to do that. But on these networks, there's a lot of things that you can do organically for free. And what I like to call these, and there's a lot of different names we can put them, but very simply, they're social signals, right? They're different ways of engaging that we can proactively use once we listen to a conversation that might be applicable to our business, we can follow these people. It is something that I think is actually underutilized by a lot of brands who may not want to follow a lot of people. This, this gives us the ability in a room of three or 400 million users, depending on the social network, to actually tap someone on the shoulder and let them know that we're there. We can retweet their content or uh, repost their Instagram image. Uh, we can like things and favorite things. And each time we do this, it shows up in their notifications. And right now, the holy grail of social media marketing is the ability to show up in the notifications of a given user if you really want them to pay attention to you. So you don't just find a tweet or, or find something and immediately do the guerrilla selling approach and just contact them saying, hey, I noticed your tweet. It's still creepy for a lot of people. There's a lot of other things you can do to help build that relationship. And these are what the social signals can and should be used for. And then I get back to the point I made. 
you know, don't exploit the ability to do this and don't exploit the conversation. Social media is all about these new tools that we have, but it's the old rules. And it's the old rules not only of business etiquette and, and really social etiquette, but also of trying to fit these leads that we find into our traditional funnel so that it becomes a lead that then the organization can work on. So in that aspect, I want to leave you with uh, two more slides. And I've been doing a lot of work uh, with this, this concept of social media operations. And the larger the, the company, obviously the more important this becomes at the enterprise level. But there are more tweets than human beings. Um, <laughs> uh, there's just an incredible amount of content being created, you know, exponentially increasing on an annual basis. So really you have to have a system in place to manage this chaos. And it's not just what to listen for, but also what to do after you find that data from your social listening. Uh, one of my favorites that I refer to in Maximize Your Social, um, you know, Professor Edwards Deming, I, I borrow a lot of his quotes because I think it's brilliant. You know, if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. And it really is true. So when you begin a listening program or influencer marketing or any program, you know, are your employees actually documenting what they're doing? Because the problem is the only way to scale in all this is – a combination of what you see here. You either hire more people, you tweak your process, which is where you really need to make sure that you're, you're listening for the right keywords, you're acting upon them in the right way. You can do paid, obviously. And paid, you know, it's, it's not as important for listening as, the, as it is to others, but you can seed conversations by boosting your content or making sure that you become aware, uh, you know, of people talking about subjects that are important to your company. And hopefully they generate more conversations that are relevant to you that give you the ability to send social signals or tools. And, you know, as the co-founder of the Social Tool Summit, I, the only real way to efficiently listen in social is to have not only the right tool in place, but obviously to have the right people managing it and using it intelligently and efficiently. So I'll leave you with that note, and hopefully um, you have a few data points to work with uh, for social listening for lead generation. I'm going to stop talking and now turn it over to our next presenter. Thanks very much, Neil. You are either my first or second favorite Schaefer on this webinar. It is Jay <laughs> Bear. I am back. We're going to talk about listening to your all-important customers. Love those haters. Finding value in customer complaints. I am the president of Convince and Convert, a strategy firm that helps large organizations with their uh, digital marketing and online customer experience. Uh, New York Times bestselling author of five books, keynote speaker, blogger, podcaster, lots of other things. But today, I want to talk to you about your customers. It doesn't matter whether you're selling software or cars or licorice or beer. You have more customer feedback than ever before. From January 2014 until May of this year, my friends, in the United Kingdom, there was an 800% increase in social media complaints about business, not because business in the U.K. all of a sudden uh, became much less efficient or had all kinds of service problems. It's because it is so much easier to complain in social media via mobile app than it is to call or email. Businesses of all types, businesses of all sizes, businesses around the world are seeing this exact same shift toward more and more and more customer feedback in more places. And just wait. Wait until today's young consumers become the dominant customer cohort. I have two kids, uh, two teenagers, 17 and 14. They both have smartphones, which is the worst named product ever because the only part of that device they don't want to use is the phone. No interest in the phone, uh, very little interest in email, but they text 300 times a day. They use Snapchat the way I eat bacon greedily and lustily. I do not believe, I fundamentally do not believe that my daughter is going to wake up one day at the age of 24 and say, man, you know what I missed out on? The joys of telephonic communication. Every company has spent so much time figuring out how to answer the phone and answer email, and we have to understand that we've got to change the way we think about customer feedback and listen to our customers in more places and more, in more ways because the trend is happening right now. We all have a love-hate, hate-love relationship with customer feedback. I think this sign 
captures that relationship particularly well. Come in and try the worst rum and coke that one guy on Yelp ever had in his life. We know inherently that customer feedback is important. We'll talk about that in a second. But yet sometimes we don't want that feedback because we're human beings. When people tell us that we're less than perfect, it is only natural that we take some measure of offense. But that is a difficult and dangerous way to run your business, my friends. You need to embrace complaints. And when you do that, when you embrace complaints, you keep your customers. Recently this year, I created a very, very large comprehensive research project uh, with Edison Research, and we surveyed thousands of Americans about who complains and where, where they complain, why they complain, and how. And what we found was simply remarkable. What we found that answering uh, complaints, if somebody answers uh, a complaint, if your business answers a complaint from a customer, it increases customer advocacy. It makes a bad situation better. Conversely, if you fail to answer a complaint, if you ignore a complaint, it decreases customer advocacy. It takes a bad situation and it makes it worse. And as uh, the author Dave Kirpin uh, is fond of saying, if you refuse to answer, that is in fact an answer. It's an answer that says, we don't care about you very much. So we know this to be true. I think we all know that keeping the customers we have is a more efficient and financially sound way to run your business than continuing to get more and more and more and more new customers, right? But yet we don't actually run our businesses that way. Think about how much we spend on marketing and how little comparatively spend on customer service, despite the fact that only a 5% increase in customer retention can increase company profits by 25 to 85%. So what I want you to do is to embrace complaints to make yourself better. See, here's the part that we never want to talk about. 95% of your dissatisfied customers never take the time to complain. They just magically disappear like, meh, I didn't really like it. They just go poof and they're gone forever. They are the meh in the middle. The people who complain, the people who reach out or lash out on on Twitter or Facebook or even email or the telephone or Yelp or TripAdvisor or Spiceworks or G2 Crowd or whatever review site is important to you, DealerRater, ApartmentRatings.com, whatever it happens to be, those haters are in fact the canary in the coal mine. They are the early warning detection system for your business. And while it may be difficult for you to hear what they have to say, recognize that they're using their time to help make your business better. So what we have to do is look harder and listen harder to our customers. It's not so much about just answering the phone and answering emails now. You have to be strategic and proactive in how you find customer feedback because some of the very, very best customer feedback isn't directed to you um, specifically. As was mentioned earlier, in many cases, people reach out uh, to businesses or mention businesses but don't actually use their at handle in a Twitter context, right? So you've got to use a broader set of, of listening is exactly what, what Neil was talking about. He's, he's dead on there. So find every mention of your business in every channel. Use Cision to do that. Um, you can be looking at discussion boards and forums, which is gold, review sites, obviously social media sites. Find all the places that you're mentioned and then use those customer complaints for what they really are, which is free market research. Uh, you see the word cloud. I want to tell you how I made that. Uh, I did this in 10 minutes. I went to Amazon and I grabbed the 10 most recent reviews of my previous book, Utility, copied and pasted all the review text, went to Wordle.net, which is a free word cloud uh, uh, producing uh, website, and I pasted all the content in there, pressed the button, presto changeo, here is the word cloud to represent the density of mentions of specific words and phrases of all the last 10 reviews of my book on Amazon. Now you'll see there's lots of different phrases there, marketing, that doesn't really tell me much, but look uh, right in the middle there, it says new examples. One of the things that people really like about that book is that there's lots of new examples in that book that people haven't heard before. So when I'm doing webinars, when I'm giving speeches, when I'm writing white papers, when I'm writing blog posts, I always try and find new examples. This is the kind of insight that you can find just by listening to your customers. But you can take it one step further, and I want you desperately, desperately to steal this idea. 
if you take nothing away from my seven-minute segment, I want you to steal this idea. La Pan Quotidien is a, a chain of bakery cafes. There's about 220 locations. They're based in Brussels, Belgium, many locations in the U.S., primarily in the East. And their customer experience manager, Aaron Pepper, uh, is really, really smart about listening to customers. And she has seen about a 70% increase in overall feedback in the last year since she's been there. Not because people have more to say about her company. It's because she looks harder. She looks harder. She listens better to what customers are saying. So she's really, really good at, at embracing complaints. And when somebody does leave a negative review on Yelp or TripAdvisor or Urban Spoon or a site like that, she does what you should do. She answers in public because customer service is, in fact, a spectator sport. She answers in public and says, we're terribly sorry we disappointed you and your feedback's great. We're going to send this to the store manager to make sure that this doesn't happen again and you know all the things you're supposed to do. But it's what she does next that's so bright, and here's the part you should steal. So in many cases, she lets it sit for a couple of hours after she's replied publicly. And then she replies in private because almost all of these review sites uh, have some sort of private messaging function. And she says, you know, I've been thinking. And sir, you are a discerning customer. You see things that other customers simply do not see. You have, my friend, a gift. What I'd like you to do, with your permission, of course, I'd like to send you two gift cards per month. And with these, upon quotidian gift cards, I'd like you to visit a different location each time. And when you visit our location, I'd like you to then click this link and fill out this detailed survey of your experiences because you understand things that customers usually just don't understand. You can really help us be better. And they absolutely do it. She now has more than 100 of these secret shoppers working for her every month, visiting different locations, giving her massively detailed information about what they think they can do better. She has successfully turned hate into help, took people who left one-star or two-star reviews and turned them into secret shoppers and marketing research for the cost of a gift card. If you remember one thing, remember this. Haters are not your problem. Ignoring them is. I'm going to turn it over to my pal, Scott Stratton, the one, the only, who's going oh. to bring the anchor leg, so to speak. I mean, like the clean-up spot for the Blue Jays. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. You are the Jose Batista Jay. backflip of this webinar. I just did it, but it looks awkward because it's in my home office by myself. I just threw the cap. So kind of how it works. Jeff, Mark, Neil, Jay, thank you so much for actually speaking intelligently. Now it's my turn. So we're going to flip that upside down. Uh, speaking of listening, uh, I saw a tweet from uh, Kristen Amanda who's listening, uh, has a sick baby in Portland, and she's trying to rock the baby to sleep. So I'm going to try to keep my anger down to an almost non-obscene level. I uh, hope the baby feels better. Here at the unhousehold, we have five children, so we understand the, um, the sick baby side. So um, thoughts are with you. Hope the baby feels better soon. On with the show. If you want to know about me, eh, you know, not much to know. President of Unmarketing Incorporated, four-time uh, best-selling business author. But on the employee side, and why I'm going to talk about listening to your employees, I used to be an HR generalist. I was an HR professor, uh, professor at the Sheridan College School of Business here. Um, I had to get out of HR when I realized um, I hate people, and so it was a bad choice for a, a career. But, you know, HR might actually do that to you. I'm not sure if I hated them before going into it or because I was in it. I'm not sure. Also, one of the top social media influencers on Twitter, according to this fine, fine company that is hosting our show today and on with that show. One of the biggest things I noticed when I, first of all, I'd like to say I am so ecstatic that I am no longer in HR. When I was in HR in the late 90s, and early 2000s, somebody had a blog that uh, was very rare. People speaking out with their own voice that had any sort of exponential reach was very rare. We were still getting used to this Internet thing. We're getting, we were at the point where we're saying, I don't know if we need a website or not, and there were like five email addresses per company, and you had to figure out who got them. So we have this panic nowadays that anybody can talk at any time and it can reach the entire world. So we have this massive panic of policy in HR. We're really good in HR of creating these policies. And we, I see this all the time. Still today, still 15 years after 
that I was sitting in an HR chair. We have these blanket policies that says, feel free, everybody, our wonderful employees, feel free to tweet, but you have to put this disclaimer on your bio, which is all tweets are my own and not a reflection of my employer. And that, my friends, is the biggest mistake you can make when it comes to people who work for you. So I'm talking to you marketers who have an influence in this policy. Like people are sitting there wondering, oh, I didn't realize that wasn't the official spokesperson for Pepsi, and there's 23,000 employees on Twitter. The biggest part of this is that Jeff said that you know, the best time to tweet is 24-7. And what I want to play off that is saying that your employees are tweeting or on social 24-7 themselves. And what this policy, what this gives a reflection of is two things. One, that you're not a representation of your employer, which you are. And two, it gives a false sense of freedom of speech. Well, as long as I have this disclaimer on it, I can lose my mind about a political party, about a, uh, a religion or a race or what. As long as I have this disclaimer, I'm good to go. That's the problem. The policy actually should say all tweets are my own and I'm a reflection of my employer. That's the point. Your biggest marketing tools out there are your employees. They're the frontline people. Without employees, we've got nothing. That's how it works. And that makes them feel better with this policy. This just shows people that they have an impact in the brand, that social media shouldn't be policed and have a policy. What it should have is a training and an awareness of, yes, it's out there. Yes, you have a voice. And your voice is incredibly powerful to our company. So let's please make sure we use it responsibly. Let's think before we tweet. You might have 32 followers, but it can reach 32 million people depending on what is said. That's the point of all this type of stuff. Make them feel empowered. Make them feel good. People say, well, Scott, we don't trust this section of employees to be tweeting with our brand name associated to them. Listen to me very carefully. If you don't trust your employees, you do not have a social media problem. You have a hiring problem. Don't hire people you don't trust. Twitter is not a problem for you. So I want to show you a, a couple of things of catching people in the act of good, catching employees in the act of good. We're really good, and especially in HR, is catching them in the act of bad. I'll give you an example here, the president uh, of a university. So Devin Del, uh, Denali tweets out, yo, EKU Prez, come shovel my driveway road, and I'll come to class tomorrow. Deal. So this is obviously a big huge storm that was happening. I think he was excessive by asking him to shovel the road. But anyways, here's the opportunity. Now, this is the opportunity for the president of a university to do something. And this is a a great example of what you can do when you actually are there just to listen. And the president jumps in and says, it's a deal. What's your address? Now, I'm sure Devin himself is just ready to change his pants because he might not have expected an answer. Devin then privately gives him his his, uh, address. And lo and behold, there's the president shoveling the driveway and says a deal is a deal before or after, uh, before and after the driveway and uh, expect to see you in class tomorrow, which is great. So then what happens here is a picture of his, uh, uh, the president with uh, Devin's mom, and maybe mom can hold the dog up a bit or put the dog on the ground. I'm not sure we needed the legs like that. But imagine now the president holds this over the student's head from now on, which is I have a picture with your mom. And the next day, here's uh, Devin's tweet, no class this week, but I held up my end of the deal anyways. And he's there with the president. It's the only two people, I think, on campus because it was closed due to the weather. But here's the best result here, too. Devin says, I will literally never complain about going to class again. Now, how is this relating into um, uh, an employee side of things? Because it looks like, obviously, the president heard a student say something. But the president works for the university. The university can see this happening. This is the best marketing possible. This thing goes out on Facebook. It gets shared. It gets spread. And you see this reaction, this trickle effect that happens on the status itself. Becca says, President Benson is seriously an amazing administrator. He responds very quickly and answers emails. Uh, Terry says, I love it. Our daughter is considering EKU, and this is definitely a vote in its favor. And he says, snarky students beware. And Chris says, class act, and on and on and on and on. We have an impact. All employees have an impact now, depending on the employee, that can be good or bad. And the university can use this side of thing, and marketing can use this side, putting it on their own page. Hey, look what just happened with our president. We can put it up on Instagram, put it up on Twitter. We can share these things. Put them out in the news. This is a spreadable thing. This is a shareable thing. We share emotion. And when the people that work for you, your employees, evoke said emotion, you can capitalize on that. You can leverage that. We're always talking about, I've heard for years, just 
I, all I do is keynotes and write ranting books, and we hear all these things from people on stage and in books about storytelling and how do we craft our story. You don't craft your story. Your employees do. Your customers do. Your job is to take now the written story and share it. You're the bookstore of your brand. You're the library of your brand. You have all collection of stories that have already occurred, not written by you, but leveraged by you. There's a huge difference. And let's catch them in doing something good. Here's another example is of a woman who went to a Home Depot in Texas, and uh, she had an initial problem with Home Depot. They didn't have the washer dryer she wanted. She couldn't find anybody to help her, so she went to Lowe's, and that was it. Well, now she needs some other things. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She went to Best Buy uh, for, for the uh, items she was looking for. Then again, the next week, so she was already down on the brand. The next week she goes in, she went to Home Depot to find something, a ramp to build for her dog who was getting hip replacement surgery and needed to get into the swimming pool for the dog's physio. She didn't go to Lowe's because they're not dog friendly, and she went to Home Depot. So she gave them another chance. And when she walked in, a whole bunch of employees went around her, surrounded her with dog biscuits and an apron to give to the dog, and they started brainstorming the idea. And here's what happened two weeks later. And she posted it on our Unmarketing Facebook page. You see Becky says, my heart is overflowing. The folks from Home Depot 509 in Cedar Park uh, taking their own time to create a ramp for Murphy so he can swim, then recover from hip surgery. Great people do exist. We can't thank them enough. And you know what she said at the end to me in her post itself? She said, no sale, no tweet, no promotion, no hiring change will ever affect me more than what these people did. Your employees are doing these things, and then customers are sharing them on social. So I don't mean listen for employees by just listening to employees' tweets. I mean listen to your customers who are calling out your employees for good. And then go back, and I hope that Cedar Park Home Depot went back to those employees, gave them a raise, gave them even a high five or a free piece of wood or whatever you're going to give. They say, you know what? You're our brand. You represent the brand. All tweets are your own, and you're a reflection of us. I'll throw it to Michelle now. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. All of you were fantastic. Um, and just I, we have lots of questions coming in as well. Before we get to the question and answer session, we do have a poll question for you guys. Um, I know a lot of the, the speakers today were talking about how you can listen and engage. Cision has uh, excellent tools. And if you're interested in learning how you can um, uh, learn more about the tools. We have a uh, Cision uh, Social Edition and Cision Visible that help you together to listen and engage with your customers. We would love to uh, offer you a demo so you can understand how your organization can leverage that better. Please feel free to uh, answer yes or no if you would like a demo at this time. And as you're answering the poll questions. Yes, yes, uh, I want a demo. <laughs> That's great. Um, we, we do have several questions. So we will start off. I will go back to you, Jeff. This is a question that came in and asking about, can you provide techniques and a process on how to learn to blog along with the best times to blog? Jeff. Hi. Um, yes, got me here. We're back. Okay. okay. I was on mute for a minute second. The best time to blog, let's maybe answer that one first. Uh, I still think that uh, you've got to think about where your main audience is because most of my audience is in the US. I do make sure the blog gets published uh, about 11 a.m. New York time. Uh, not what is good for me, but I schedule that. But you still got to think global. So, uh, And a blog is always going to be live once you've published. So. I tweet 24-7. I actually tweet you know, every 15 minutes, but I automate that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this next question came um, around your section, Mark, and the question is, how do you find out who your advocates are and ways and the best ways to reach them? Well, there's, uh, there's lots of good ways to do that, both formal and, and informal. I'll answer it quickly. Um, there are some of the tools out there that are um, kind of uh, low cost would uh, include uh, something like uh, Tracker. Uh, you can find people who are the best at really moving content 
uh, around uh, your uh, keywords in your in your industry. You can see who they're interacting with, if they're interacting with competitors. There are more um, expensive programs out there that really go beyond social media, something like Opinions, that's A-P-P-I-N-I-O-N-S, like Opinions with, a, with an A in the front. That uh, They actually tap into about uh, 6 million online resources. So if you're in an industry like legal or medical, where some of the influencers might not necessarily be hanging out on social media, that might be a way to go. But the one other point I will make is that sometimes it's just paying close attention to your, your, um, your, your content stream. We heard some really great examples from, uh, from Jay and, and Scott and Neil today. And the challenge is going beyond the dashboards because the dashboards will show the number of mentions or they'll show sentiment. But you're also in, in, that, in that stream, there are strong, small signals of people wanting to connect to you. And you, you're not going to get that from a dashboard. You can't be a lazy marketer. You've got to dig down beneath those pie charts and, and look at what people are actually saying. Awesome. And Cision allows you to do that. Isn't that wonderful? It's the perfect pair. Yeah. Um, Day for Cision. The, the next <laughs> the next question is for you, Scott. Um, as when you're talking about you know employees and listening to employees, this question is: What key points should I communicate when building employee engagement efforts for social media and business? I, I the key point is really in that policy that the most powerful brand voice is the voice of our employees, both on and off social. And one of the biggest parts they want need to realize is it's not necessarily about employees tweeting or sharing something on Facebook, but having them learn the impact of that, that's important. But they need to realize, especially frontline employees, that what they do on the floor, what they do on the phone, what they do in email also can be related and relayed socially, publicly. That don't say anything or do anything you don't want to see on a public forum, you don't want to see on a billboard. And I think that the exponential reach that we can have, and it's, it's, a, it's a top-down thing, though. It's a culture thing. Do, do you value your employees or don't you? Do you have warm body syndrome in hiring, or do you think they're actually an asset to the company? And I think that means managers need to know that. I think that means the directors need to know that, and from executive and all the way down, there's a value there. So looking at them and saying, here's the impact. Here's what can happen good. Here's what can happen bad. And understand that you choose which way that goes, that our company brand is, is moving constantly. There's no plateau. There's no static brand impact. It's always going up or down. They choose that pivot point where it goes up or down or up or down. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Uh, this next question is for you, Neil. You talked about having the right tools and the right resources in place. And this question is, can a business succeed in social listening and engagement when your social media department is a single person? <laughs> that's a, a great question. Um, you know, it all depends on that one person that's 40 hours a week and where are you going to invest your time. And that's where the process is going to be important uh, and the tools are going to be critical, right? Because you can, if you've ever tried to manually search for influencers and see how many hours of that time it could take versus, you know, uh, having a monthly subscription to, to a tool like a tracker, you begin to see the time is money. So really, you have a social media program. What is considered the ROI of that? Is it lead generation? Is it brand awareness? Is it, you know, traffic generation? So it, it all depends on where that is and where listening fits into that. I like to say don't try to fit, you know, a, a square box into a round uh, hole. Uh, square peg around hole. I mean, it just, you can't, there, there's so much going on. You can't expect that everything out there is going to be appropriate and applicable for your unique business situation and why you're using social media. But if listening is an important part, uh, it's, it's a matter of making the process. And because social media is a time suck, even if you use it professionally, of actually creating these, these time silos of, you know, well, 10% of my time is going to be spent listening. And that means it's going to be however minutes a day, and I'm going to see how much value I can generate from that over the course of a month. And I'm going to compare it to all the other things I'm doing and see what works and see what doesn't work uh, and try to tweak things to make sure I get better and better at doing that you know, on a month-to-month -month basis would be the best way I can describe to, to create a process around that and to try to figure out how much time you should be spending on listening for your particular business. Fantastic. Thanks. And Jay, I have not forgotten you. Uh, you had a great example of the Le Pen um, customer service. 
So a question for you is, how do you manage the customer service from the PR service response? Because a lot of times those two groups are, 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 are siloed. So how would you, or are there any best practices, or how would you go about um, responding to folks given that not necessarily these two entities speak to each other? Yeah, absolutely. We are faced with this all the time with corporate clients. Uh, it's a two-step process. One, determining the rules of engagement. So under what circumstances do what department ever respond to customers in a live fire scenario and on what channel? So uh, who is in charge of handling tweets? Who's in charge of handling Facebook? Who's in charge of handling Yelp? Who's in charge of handling discussion boards and forums? Obviously phone and email. So literally we do a lot of creating um, flowcharts that say if this, then that uh, kind of triage scenarios. But then regardless of who is actually typing responses or speaking responses or writing responses, the, the, all of those responses need to be analyzed and evaluated uh, using Cision or other tools to say here are the key issues that bubbled up today, that bubbled up this week, that bubbled up this month, and bubbled up this quarter. And that information needs to be distributed broadly throughout the organization, not just between customer service and PR, but between customer service and everything, right? Marketing, ops, you know, R&D. Uh, every part of the organization. So the same way that we would be very enthusiastic about spreading social media data and social media metrics around an organization so that everybody needs to know what's going on or can know what's going on, the same is true, if not more so, uh, about customer service and insights gleaned from your customers. Uh, another example from Lapan Quotidian is they had a, a deal where somebody, uh, they, they saw some, some uh, reviews and people were saying, you know, the lemonade kind of sucks. And Erin was like, well, that's weird because we're sort of known for our lemonade, so what is up? So she actually took that information, and she does this routinely, sent it to the store managers um, on their extranet based on which stores those complaints were occurring in, and they actually tracked it back, sort of walked it back and found that two or three of their locations were using an old recipe, uh, like an accidental old recipe, right? And so it's that kind of insight that can really improve your operations, but only if that information is spread throughout the organization. Excellent. And with that, we will conclude. We're actually at time. But I wanted to let you know that, again, we have an archive of webinars on the Cision website, Cision.com. Uh, we have a lot of um, other past webinars that, we, that can be found there. And uh, please feel free to go there. And we will be posting this presentation as well. We didn't get all, to all the questions, so we will be going through those. We will be responding to those on our blog. So if you didn't get your question answered, please check out the blog, and we will have responses to those. Um, again, Cision, we are a leading global media intelligence company serving the complete workflow of today's communication, social media, and content marketing professionals. We have several groups that we represent, the Gorkana Group, PR Web, Help a Reporter Out, and Eye Contact Brands. Thanks again to our speakers for, for participating today, and thank all of you for being on the line. Have a great afternoon.